Welcome to today's Danfoss webinar, Quick System Performance Checks, hosted by Jamie Kitchen. My name is Michael Beckerman, and I will be the moderator for today. During this 60-minute session, Jamie will help you improve the preventive maintenance experience of your complete HVACR system. Webinar attendees are muted, but I encourage you to submit your questions in the GoToWebinar module um, in the chat, the chat box area. We will answer a select number of your questions at the conclusion of the session. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand on our YouTube channel, Danfoss Cool US, um, later this week. So with that all behind us, let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce the presenter for today's webinar, Jamie Kitchen, Danfoss engineer. Jamie has over 30 years of experience with mechanical systems, 20 of which have been with Danfoss in the HVACR industry. Jamie, take it away. Thanks, Michael. You know, when we pick the uh, titles for these webinars, it's always, you know, a little bit of give and take. This isn't just going to be, you know, how to ascertain COP or the BTUs per hour of the system. It's really going to cover part of the preventive maintenance side as well. In other words, do you have the right airflow? Because if you don't have the airflow, there's no way you're going to have the system performance. The same goes with the voltage and current, all these different issues. Everything kind of goes into a basket that determines your performance. Yeah, it's great to know that you have a specific COP of a certain value, but it really doesn't tell you if, for example, what's causing that. So these are the checks that will go in to ensure that when you're done, this system is going to be operating in peak performance. So let's get started. We got lots of stuff to cover. So a performance check can be something as simple as checking voltage or current. You could do a, a start characteristic on the compressor to make sure it's starting properly. All of these things should be familiar to a lot of people who do preventive maintenance. On the other side, it could be a complete energy assessment using a psychometric chart and calculating your specific uh, uh, sensible heat ratio and on down the line. It all depends on the task at hand and what needs to be accomplished. So the first thing, like we always do, is have a checklist. You want this checklist a, so you're not going to miss something, all right? Because it's pretty easy to get distracted, all right? There's always pressure on us to get the job done. There's going to be times when you're going to be thinking of other things. Always have a checklist. Number two, it allows you to look back in case something happens and see what you actually did. If something is operating fine when you left and you have the values of whatever you measured on file and you can look back and see it, it's a big deal because somebody can't say, hey, you didn't do this, right? Always have some important checklists. The basics, obviously, error measurements, both qualitative, quantitative, and we'll get into these. Winding measurements, another big one. You'd be surprised how often they're done wrong. Voltage currents, temperatures, cycle times, and of course, the space condition. Cycle times and space condition, a lot of times, are linked together. And of course, there's other ones. Measuring pressures a lot of times is probably down the list. It can be done, but a lot of times you can tell what's going on without actually having to put your gauges on there. First thing we want to do when you get there is, just like a detective, you want to ask the right questions. Do not discount the information you can get from talking to people especially in some of the refrigeration stuff. If there's a meat manager there or a manager of the store, a lot of times these people will notice something wrong long before it happens, right? So you can ask questions like, how long has a unit had this problem? And they may say, oh man, I noticed like a month and a half ago, it started taking longer and longer to cool down, right? Was it operating correctly until now? In other words, was it an instant failure or did something happen and it just stopped working? Has the unit been moved, right? Is it in a location where you're gonna have good airflow, all right? Is there a 50 foot extension cord running to it? Another really important one, have you had any work done on it recently? Always ask if they have any receipts or invoices from service work. If somebody replaced a compressor three weeks ago 
and charge the system and a compressor has failed and it's low on charge and or that's a big deal now you know what's going on right if the system's been running for 20 years and suddenly something died eh, maybe that's not so surprising other things like has the power gone off lately right have you noticed other equipment having a hard time starting maybe indicating really poor voltage these kinds of things can be important and give you an idea of how to solve that problem. However, like always, verify yourself before taking action. And this includes following up on what they say with your own quantitative measurements. The next thing is using your eyes and your ears for sight check observations, right? General appearance, if all the fin uh, all the fins on the coil are laying flat on the condenser, it should not be a surprise when you have high condensing temperature, right? If you see oil leaking, if power cords are frayed, if it looked like somebody poured acid all over the start relay, all this kinds of stuff can give you an indication of what's going on, all right? Airflow issues. You'd be surprised the number of time back when I used to go to bars, I would overhear the manager say something about, you know, the beer not getting cool or something wrong, only to look over and see a bunch of boxes stacked up against the condenser. Little things like that can point you in the right direction and give you a pretty good indication. And even if it's not the root cause, fixing it will make the system run a lot better and probably eliminate future issues. All right. Air measurements, indirect air measurements are things like ice. If something's iced up, it ain't going to have airflow through it. Stopped fans, dirty filters. If your air filter looks like a sweater, I've seen things as obvious as a stick stopping a fan from turning to things where one blade on the outdoor unit is all wonky and you can hear it going whoop, 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 as it goes around. Things like that stick with you. Another one, and if you have been in our previous webinars, you'll know this one vegetation and other things people love to put stuff around these units they don't realize you know fair enough that what they're doing is really hampering the performance of the unit but you can have a wonderful sear 16 unit and you put a fence around it or a bunch of other stuff or it's not installed correctly and suddenly you've turned it into a sear 10 system because it's going to operate about 25 degrees hotter than it needs to so always recommend clearing brush and other things around the unit. Again, if you've got a failed compressor and there's a piston in it, and you see a situation like this where there is very poor airflow, there's a good chance they're linked together. Ice buildup on coils. Now, this may not even have been a problem. Nobody may have noticed it, but you did. And the simple fact that the drip delay isn't long enough in this image to stop the water from freezing, or the condensate drain has turned into an aquarium, right, basically means that water is accumulating and spilling over onto the floor. It is not safe and it should not be allowed to happen. That extra weight on the coil can easily cause it to buckle and bend and lead to all kinds of problems, right? The issue here relatively quick to fix is either fixing the drip time fixing the drain or checking the time or defrost clock if the defrost clock is set for winter time well guess what in the summertime there's three times as much moisture in the air even inside so you need to adjust that time clock to increase the number of defrost that you're going to undertake or better yet put a demand defrost unit in like you know, a little electronic controller that does defrost on demand and termination based on temperature. That way it's always gonna defrost regardless of how often it's used, whether the door's left open or the time of year. Once again, electrical connection. Now, this one here happened to have a snake in it. That's not really the important part. It scared the crap out of the guy when he first opened the box, that's funny, but that's not really the issue here. The main thing is these components are looking pretty tough. So the recommendation was replace them, 
check the conductors. The conductors were overheated, discolored, the start cap, all this kind of stuff should be replaced and inspected. Because if you're gonna put the effort in, especially if you're replacing an expensive component like a compressor, you know, that's a couple of grand maybe, it's cheap insurance to make sure that this stuff is done. Especially the capacitor. A weak capacitor is gonna to lead to high energy use if it's a run capacitor. And if it's a start capacitor, and there was a delay on start, you can kiss the life expectancy of the compressor goodbye because you're drawing six times the normal amps for way longer than you should. And the more often you cycle, the less the life expectancy of the compressor is going to be. Speaking of, let's look in the first thing that you're actually going to want to check a lot of times. This is a key thing for compressor diagnostics whether it is a small fractional to when we used to meg out the large motors in centrifugal compressors. In this case, you need to identify the winding. We have a single phase compressor here, which means you're gonna have a run winding, a start winding, and a common. The way this works is the compressor fires up with the start winding, back EMF is generated, kicking out using the relay, the start winding, and it runs on run. However, there are some key things here you need to find out or follow. So how are we gonna do this? Well, we're telling you that we're measuring across the run in common, but let's say that title bar wasn't there. Let's just take some measurements and then I'll tell you what, what you found. So you're gonna take a one uh, a winding, or sorry, a, res a measurement between two pins on the compressor representing one end of a winding. The first one you take is two between ohms between the ones that are showing. The next one is a lot more, six and a half ohms. Interesting. The final one is across the top and that's 8.1 ohms. Well, guess what? The run winding has the lowest resistance. The start run winding has a much higher resistance. And when you measure between run and start, you're measuring between the two windings in series. So you could almost add or close to adding those two resistances up. Minus, wait for it, the internal overload. And this is key. This compressor and a lot of other compressors have an internal overload. So if you look at this, those three pins are identified as 12, 13, and 14 on this diagram. And this is the start, um, uh, start on, on the compressor. There is a little relay in there that kicks out the start winding. However, notice something. 14 is the common here. So whenever you measure anything from 14, 14 to 12, or 14 to 13, you measure through the winding protection, okay? So think about this. If you have a hot compressor and that overload is open, and this happens a whole lot, irregardless of what you measure, you're gonna measure an open winding, infinite resistance. Now, it always seems kind of funny to me that you would have both an open start and an open run winding, but this doesn't seem to bother a lot of people because we get a whole lot of compressors back that there's nothing wrong with them. And, and most of the time they have an internal overload, not always, some people forget to check the other one too. Oh, this is your final check you should make. If you wanna find out if one of the windings is truly open, always measure between run and start, 12 and 13. This way you will bypass the winding protector and because these two windings are in series, if anyone is open, you will get infinite resistance. And to be honest with you, it really doesn't matter which one is open, because if one is open, the compressor is a boat anchor, all right, in this case. So before you condemn anything and do a whole lot of expensive work, make sure you take that measurement. Oh, you also gotta ask yourself, why is this compressor overheating? That, you know, there's a common reason behind that, you should definitely find out why. So what do these things look like? Well, when you're dealing with a damp os compressor and these things are pretty useful, here it is. This is the part that's gonna be against the compressor. So in this case, we've got a external overload. 
you can see at the bottom, it's like a bimetallic um, piece of metal there that clicks off and on. And you got the three pins for the compressor. And at the top, you have your little relay, potential relay. The flip side of it is where the power is going to go. So you can see the overload is removable. You can take it and pull it out and put a new one in. It's got the alignment tabs there for going onto the compressor. And you can see the pins for adding the power. So in this case, your power is going to go through one side of the overload, through the overload, through the compressor, and then back out to terminal 10, which is your neutral connection. That completes your circuit. In this case, or this way, if the overload opens up, it kills power to the compressor, generating a hopefully call. Your start capacitor, in this case, this is a high starting torque compressor, is going to connect onto terminals 11 and 13. If you do not connect them on terminals 11 and 13, it will not work the way it's supposed to, and the compressor will probably not start against the load, or you're going to have some kind of issue down the road. Now, remember, different manufacturers have different arrangements, so always check with the manufacturer to identify this stuff. Don't assume everyone is the same, because we're not. Right, everybody's got a different way of doing this. Capacitors are one of these things that really either get ignored or condemned for no apparent reason. However, they are an important part of the system. A start capacitor is generally, 99% of the time, from what I see, anyways, is made out of plastic and it is will have a high microfarad rating, a high capacitance rating compared to a run capacitor. So microfarads, in this case, this one is 145 to 175. And they will generally only be, and should only be in the circuit for a fraction of a second, okay? The reason they're made out of plastic is because they do not have a reason to dissipate heat. These are designed to increase the starting torque of a compressor. Now, keep in mind, it is not a good idea to increase the or, or use a capacitor that has a higher microfarad rating unless there is an absolute requirement to do so, because the starting torque as it increases puts additional stress on the windings. Remember, there's always some kind of deflection in the windings. So the more you have higher starting torque than you need, the more you're going to flex that winding and slowly damage it. Run capacitors are in the system all the time. They are designed to improve power factor. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole college course on this, but adding capacitance improves the power factor or the efficiency of the compressor. So a lot of high, in fact, every high efficiency compressor that is single phase will have a run capacitor on it, along with a lot of other ones. Always make sure this appears to be in good working order. There's no oil leaking. It's not bulged or anything like that. All right. Make sure and test these, both the start and run capacitors. And if you're wondering why it has a metal body, that's pretty straightforward. It's full of oil. The oil works with natural convection. So as the capacitor's in the circuit full time, it allows heat to dissipate through the surface of the metal casing because metal conducts heat much better than plastic. So even though they have a much lower microfarad rating, they need to dissipate a lot more heat than a start capacitor. Finally, always check the capacitors as a minimum during a preventive maintenance. Always ensure single phase compressors, and this includes scrolls as well, even though they may not have a start capacitor. They need to start immediately with no hesitation. If you have a single phase recip that's not starting as it should, your first order of business should be to test that start capacitor. If it has a run capacitor, check that as well, because if it's not working properly, if the run capacitor is in the toast, the efficiency of the system will be much lower and the temperature of the winds in the compressor will be very warm. I actually got a laugh when I saw this image 
because I went to high school in the early 80s, and this is exactly the same model that we had in our electrical lab, and it was since then. But new multimeters, most of them have a capacitor check. Make sure you use a capacitor check. Using an ohm meter is great, but it's like measuring a ba battery with no load on it. You can measure 12 volts in a wet cell battery, but that doesn't tell you if it's gonna handle a load or not. The same goes with a capacitor. You'll often see a combi or dual capacitor where you'll have a single common and you'll have a rated capacitance for the fan and a rated capacitor for the compressor. The compressor is labeled hermetic. Always make sure you test these right as shown. A lot of times if one side is weak, you'll see, for example, the fan will oftentimes start up slow. That usually means there's an issue with that side of the capacitor. Make sure you check it. Don't just focus on the compressor. Another thing to be aware of, a lot of smaller compressors, whether they're scrolls or recip, are available in both three phase and single phase. A lot of times, rather than having two different terminal boxes, they'll put the same terminal box on there and they'll have dual labels. So in this case, you'll see a label for T1, T2, T3, terminal one, two, and three, that means that's a three-phase compressor, and you're going to hook L1, L2, L3 to it. You'll also see CSR on there, which stands for Common Start Run. So if this was going to be a single-phase compressor, you would identify the CSR as the correct terminals in that order, right? Don't be surprised if you see this. It doesn't mean the compressor is not what you thought it is. It just means that the terminal box is used for both designs. So once again, L1, L2, L3 has to, in the case of three-phase compressors, attach to the right terminals. If you don't attach them correctly, you will definitely know when it comes time for startup because nothing sounds louder and weirder than a scroll running backwards. Right, I have had cases where compressors have been running backwards for days and weeks. How that person did not know it was running backwards still mystifies me. But the first time you hear it, you will know. So always make sure you match up the correct phases with the correct terminals. Otherwise, the compressor is not going to pump. It will overheat and will cycle on the internal overload. Larger compressors nowadays, a lot of times, and even some of the smaller ones are coming with protection modules. So the protection module is designed to protect against things like reverse operation, poor voltage, all kinds of stuff. It also helps monitor the windings in the compressor far more accurately using thermistors embedded in the actual winding. So if you have this setup and you have powered the module correctly and you have not uh, matched up the power to the terminals correctly and it doesn't start, it is probably the electronic protection module that is stopping it from doing so. Once you hook the correct power up, it should fire up and away you go. Couple of words here. These protection modules are most of the time going to be, in fact, probably all the time, are going to be in OEM manufacturer-specific compressors. These are not going to be in a universal aftermarket. Why? Because there are some requirements in order to utilize that protection module. First and foremost, you need the thermistors embedded in the winding run through the shell of the compressor and attach to the module. So if you were to grab a general aftermarket compressor of the same capacity, you can't just stick this module on it, even if it's available, because you will have nothing to hook it up to and you will have no protection against temperature, high temperatures in the windings. That's a problem. So 
you have to replace like for like in this case. Now, remember, these terminal boxes, or sorry, these protection modules are powered and they have a specific voltage to them. I've seen everything from 12 volts DC to 240 volt AC to these. So never assume it is a certain voltage. Always verify using the compressor model number, which will identify the protection module that is in it. Speaking of voltage, you'll notice that we have different voltages here. You'll also notice that's a pretty generous range for voltage. So let me point out what this actually means. This tells you one thing, that this compressor, when it's operating between 180 and 253 volts, in the case of motor code three, if it has that voltage range applied to it, it will start and run against the conditions that can occur anywhere inside its application envelope. In other words, a set of conditions the compressor is okayed and tested to operate under, it will start with those voltages. This does not mean it can operate at 182 volts 24 seven. Remember, the lower the voltage, the higher the current and the warmer the windings. So the amount of winding insulation we would need for this compressor to operate 20 years at 180 volts would cost a fortune. So always make sure long-term voltage is close to the middle there. If it's not, find out why. This is just designed to protect against brownout conditions. You know those times in an, you know, on a July and August afternoon when everybody has their air conditioning running and you're having a heat wave and the voltage drops for two or three hours during the day? That's what this is designed to protect against. Okay, finally, one of the fewest things that is done is checking airflow. And yet more than half of the systems out there have incorrect and poor airflow, bad enough to the point that it causes performance issues. So a lot of times when you see compressors coming back flooded or overheated or whatever, a lot of times that's an airflow issue. And an airflow issue magnifies other problems such as poor defrosting, poor charge, poor voltage, all kinds of things are magnified by airflow. And remember, none of the readings that you take are meaningful. They don't mean anything until you have ascertained your airflow is correct. Now, there is probably half a dozen or more ways to take airflow. Always follow what the manufacturer recommends. If they may recommend using static pressure and they give you values for that, knock yourself out. If they use a temperature rise measure uh, method and they give you values as a target, fantastic. Follow that. Otherwise, the best way to do this is using some type of air pressure measurement tool. Okay. So a lot of times. When airflow is crappy, there are multiple reasons for it, but it is very prevalent. All right. Air filters are a big one, especially high efficiency air filters. Right. If you want to talk about air filtration and some of the issues why going into Home Depot, buying that, you know, MERV 13 or 15 one inch um, air filter when you only replace them once a year a good idea i have all kinds of facts and figures to it up. however there's more to it than just that so in college this is what we use slope monon all right and they are very accurate they can be a pain sometimes that's why we're using digital these days but back in the day this was the premium way to ascertain air volume in CFM, and it is still very, very accurate. So single readings like static only, unless you have a very specific range of values from the manufacturer, it's pretty hard to tell from static pressure only. It can get you in the ballpark maybe, but really 
the best way to test this is by getting velocity pressure. And I'll show you how to do that. Digital manometers these days, even with Bluetooth and everything else, are fantastic. You don't have to set them up. You don't have to worry about spilling the oil. They're great. All right, and with the Bluetooth, the wireless connections, it allows you to be in all different kinds of places taking measurement, air measurements. Guys, this should not take very long, all right? To put a hole in, use one of the magnetic sensors and put them in, that does not take very long. In fact, there could be holes already in there. <laughs> one of my recommendations, and this is from experience, always make sure you're familiar with the tool before you demonstrate in front of a customer. This sounds silly, but you may be super proud of your new Gee Whiz um, digital manometer. I was until I realized that it didn't work the way I thought it was and the customer was standing there looking at me like I was a moron. So make sure you know how to use this thing. Best way to do this really is use two probes and have one Parallel to the airstream, in other words, shooting straight up to the airstream in, in, or towards the airflow and one parallel to it. What you're measuring is total and static. And when they oppose each other, which they will if you actually use the thing correctly, you will get velocity pressure. And with velocity pressure, it's very easy to convert that to velocity and then to CFM with the measurements of the ductwork. Always remember to take multiple measurements because you will find that the core velocity in a ductwork is much higher than the surrounding areas. So get a profile and get it done right and you will have a very accurate value for airflow. So a lot of times now with the new you know coronavirus and air quality and all this stuff it is going to explode this new air treatment side a lot of it's going to focus on humidity control but a lot of it is going to focus on clean air you're going to get a lot of calls from customers be very careful with this all right take a look at these two filters they are both merv 11 they're both 24 inches wide. The bottom one has umpteen times more surface area than the one at the top, which means the efficiency of an air filter is directly related to the velocity of the air through it. So is the pressure drop. So the bottom filter will be far more efficient at removing particulate than the one at the top. In fact, they could probably go with a MERV 8 filter down below and still be more efficient than the one at the top. Number two, the pressure drop across the filter in the bottom will be minimal. The pressure drop across the one at the top will result in an operating cost of four to five times the original cost of the filter. That's with good maintenance and replacement. If the person has no idea where the air filter even is in their unit, make sure that you take that into account that this is not going to be changed very often. The downfall is that bottom filter is not going to fit into that one inch slot for the top one. So they're going to need a new frame. However, the savings over a couple of years will be more than enough to pay for that. All of these values are readily available and it should be a pretty easy argument to have with your customer humidity control number one after airflow because they're both related now if you're my age you know where this picture came from from the movie however latent heat removal dehumidification is going to be a huge issue down the road expect the amount of fresh air requirements for a building, especially critical care homes, long-term senior homes, and schools and other places to continue going up. Expect the cost of treating that air to go up. So the old sledgehammer approach isn't going to work anymore. Depending on where you are, the CFM rating for the unit is going to change. 
400 CFM a ton. I don't even know where that value came from. I tried to find it one time. It was very hard. I never did. That is just a number that people have been using forever. 400 CFM a ton is not really a value that probably has any benefit other than a specific temperature zone. So if you're down in Florida and you're running your AC with a 42 or 40 degree evaporator, you're probably operating around 340 CFM per ton. If you live in a place where it's hot and dry as a bone and you don't even worry about humidity, then you could probably operate this at 450 CFM a ton and save energy. Either way, you got to make sure that the CFM is at the rating recommended by the manufacturer. Okay, that is very important. When you do your inspection, uh, we did at the start, always make sure that you know what the indoor humidity is. If it's too high, that is a big problem. It can cause all kinds of health issues so it needs to be addressed humidity essentially is steam in the air look up the steam tables in an ashray handbook or something and you will find that steam contains the same energy at the same pressure and conditions as humidity that's what it is and at high concentration it causes a huge problem especially for people with compromised immune system and the elderly. The elderly have very low body mass for a high surface area, and they can easily overheat or catch hypothermia quite quickly. So you need to take this into account, and it's going to be forced on us going into the future. Dry bulb is the old what is heat problem in grade nine physics. It is basically the amount of physical energy movement of the air molecules. Wet bulb refers to the effect on dry bulb of the rate of evaporation. The drier it is, the faster you have or the quicker you have evaporation, the lower your wet bulb temperature is going to be. Now, if you've looked at and paid attention to any of the charging charts, charging charts on systems, including the ones we've covered in the last couple of presentations, you will notice that wet bulb has a huge impact on load. It is the primary focus of load. Why? Because you don't pull your house from 76 degrees down to 36 degrees like you do in refrigeration. You pull it from 76 to 72. But what you're doing is pulling a ton of moisture out of the air if there it's present and you need to. So dehumidification should be and was the primary focus of air conditioning. So. Measure dry bulb, any common thermometer will do. It measures the temperature of the air, right? And you're only measuring the sensible component of the air. So picture electric heater. Air goes in at 72, comes out at 120. That heat added was sensible only. Wet bulb mimics your body. In other words, it relies on the cooling effect of evaporation. The drier the air, the faster the evaporation, the cooler that wet sock or that wet gauze that we place on the thermometer is going to drop. Remember, you ever spilled alcohol on yourself? Like rubbing alcohol, it's cold. Why? Because it evaporates very quickly. So it pulls heat from its surroundings, i.e. your skin, and produces a physical cooling to replace the heat that is being removed from the liquid when it's evaporating. This is the same effect. The difference between wet bulb and dry bulb is called wet bulb depression. The greater the wet bulb depression, the, the lower the value of wet bulb compared to dry bulb, the drier the air. That's why under high humidity conditions, your body has a very hard time cooling itself. You can magnify this greatly with a vulnerable population, hence why this is going to be a huge focus in the future. So moving on, TXVs, refrigeration, feeding. A lot of times those service calls that you get have a lot to do with refrigeration feeding. I'm not feeding the right amount of refrigerant into the evaporator and it's got multiple causes. If you have a TXV on a system 
and everything is working correctly, the conditions that you see on the evaporator will reflect the load. So if you have a good load on the evaporator, you might be running a 24 degree evap, a 12 degrees of superheat, and you've got 10 degrees of subcooling, meaning you've got a solid head of liquid. Uh, you ice the fan, you ice up the coil, you lose a fan, you got a dirty air filter, who knows what, suddenly you don't have the load there. So you don't need all the refrigerant in there either. So the TXD throttle's closed, the compressor pumps down the pressure in the evaporator to balance its pumping capacity, and you end up with a five degree coil temperature. Now, how do you know this isn't low on charge? Pretty straightforward. You've got nine degrees of superheat. Nine degrees of superheat does not mean you're low on refrigerant. It means you don't have enough load. Ditto for the condenser subcooling. You've got seven degrees of subcooling. You're not low on refrigerant. Now, you may say, oh, I've only got nine degrees of superheat. I might need to increase my superheat on my valve. No, you don't. If the valve superheat was dialed too low, your evaporator pressure wouldn't be lower, it would be higher because you would be dumping more refrigerant into the evaporator. So it wouldn't be five degrees, it'd be 26, 27, 28 degrees with low superheat, all right? So always identify how a TXV operates. Remember, you can negate some of this with a bulb charge, but you're generally going to see an increase of superheat with high load. So you got an AC system, it's hotter than heck out, high humidity, expect higher superheat. You just loaded a bunch of warm product in your cooler or freezer, expect high superheat. Come back in eight hours after it's cooled everything down, expect your superheat to be lower. So the amount of superheat generally reflects the load. Now, the magnitude of superheat changes can depend on the bulb charge. However, there's usually, or I'll even say always, going to be some difference. Now, let's look at something that doesn't deal with load. Let's look at a low refrigerant charge. So, under the normal conditions with a proper charge, you got a 20 degree of that, 12 degrees of superheat, gobs of subcooling, 12 degrees. On the right hand side, oh, there's the five degree evaporator. What's different? Look at your superheat. It's like 35 degrees, not nine, 35. Your evaporator superheat is a direct indication of the amount of refrigerant compared to load. So 35 degrees tells us simply that we don't have enough refrigerant for our load. The kicker and key part here is your subcooling. Zero degrees of subcooling at the condenser tells you that you don't have enough refrigerant charge. Those three together tell you that you're low on charge. If your condenser subcooling was nine or 10 degrees, that would tell you that you have enough refrigerant charge, you're just not injecting it into the evaporator. So again, you need to confirm that subcooling with the TXV before you start adding charge. So what are you gonna look for? Well, long pull down times. This one's usually pretty easy because the customer is gonna be all over you for it because that's what they notice. I put stuff in there, it never gets cold, I gotta throw it out, blah, 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 blah. Warm air leaving the unit, sure, that's a good one, right? You don't have enough refrigerant to pull heat out of the air, it's gonna be warmer. No subcooling, you don't have a solid column of liquid, expect flash gas at your metering device, expect an unstable evaporator temperature. Frost on the evaporator inlet, this generally deals with A coils in air conditioning. Because you have no refrigerant, your saturation temperature in the A coil is going to be below freezing point of water, and you will have high superheat, but frost at the inlet of the evaporator. Excessive discharge temperatures. Number one way to burn out a compressor is to operate at low on charge. So expect very high discharge temperatures, high compression ratios, low compressor life. And as I already noted, unstable evaporator pressure. This is key too. Anytime you see an unstable evaporator in an AC unit, my, I'll put 20 bucks down that it's undercharged. Either that or somebody reduced the superheat setting on the TXV too low, one or the other.
Another one that's easy to check, but a lot of times isn't, is the capacity of your metering device. Easy to check, but very important. Before you start ripping anything out, verify this. If you think it never happens, you are wrong. I have lots of cases where there has been an undersized TXV put in a system because somebody selected it based on nominal capacity, which is a huge issue. You may get away with it under nominal load, but as like I said before with low charge, as soon as you load something in there, the TXV is not going to have enough capacity to meet that load and your pull down times are going to increase dramatically. Now, in AC, it's relatively easy because your evaporator temperature is pretty much the same temperature as the nominal capacity specs, which is 40, 45 degrees. However, if this is an ice cream freezer at minus 20, this two ton TXV that's rated for two tons nominal is going to give you one ton. So if you have a unit cooler or an evaporator that has 24,000 BTUs of capacity at minus 20, you're going to be in a whole lot of hurt if you use this TXV. Always size your TXV at the operating temperature conditions of the evaporator. So if it's two tons at minus 20, you need a TXV that is sized for two tons at minus 20. It's just like a compressor. Another favorite, upstream obstructions. You know, for those guys that always use nitrogen when they braze, well, if you've got frost at the outlet of your uh, filter dryer, that is not a value added component. Generally speaking, that means you have two meter devices in series, which is never good. Your eyes and ears will tell you a story here. If you have subcooling at your condenser, but you have flash gas at your meter device and it's hunting, you have to find out where that flash gas went. In other words, you need to find the pressure drop. It could be a ball valve somebody didn't open up, it could be a stuck solenoid valve, or it could just be a plugged filter dryer. Your ears and your eyes and your hands, for the most part, will give this away, all right? If it is plugged, the filter dryer or the TXV for that matter, right? Always flush the system, replace the TXV. If possible, clean the orifice on the TXV if it's removable. Re re sorry, replace the filter dryer, flush the system, because I can guarantee you there's more stuff out there. And once again, Never add refrigerant until you verify there is no subcooling at the condenser outlet. Please, you will only make this situation a lot worse. If you have checked all of this stuff and you finally have come to the realization that you've got a solid column of liquid at the TXV, but you're underfeeding the evaporator, you have checked everything else. The TXV is the right size, the super the bulbs are put in there properly adjust the superheat on the TXV. Remember, clockwise adjustment increases, counterclockwise decreases, you will see an immediate change as soon as you adjust superheat. Yes, we tell you to wait five or 10, 15 minutes because it takes time for that system to equalize. However, you will see an immediate change. So if you dial in a couple of changes and nothing happens, you've got a problem. So hold the sensing bulb in your hand and warm it up. If that doesn't help, then you either have lost your bulb charge or you have a plug TXV. Either way, the TXV has got to come out. When you pull it out, look at the inlet, liquid inlet to the TXV. If you see a plugged screen, even if you can't replace it, it at least tells you what the problem was. Now, replace the TXV or clean the screen, replace the filter dryer and flush the system and charge according to the manufacturer, all right? Thank you guys, I appreciate it, especially if you have been with us for this whole series. I hope you well, that you're well, and that you take these information with you in the future. Have a great day and thank you. All right, thank you, Jamie. We do have a couple of questions, um, so let's get into that. If by chance anyone would like to ask a question but hadn't yet, now is the time. So Jamie, um, how do I know the system is de dehumidifying correctly? 
Generally speaking, you will measure the wet bulb and dry bulb off of the coil in your supply. You will measure the airflow. And with that, you can use the formula for total heat or latent heat, and you do your calculations. Or if the manufacturer provides it, and they usually do, you can look for a set of conditions and match those conditions, right? Generally speaking, if the manufacturer provides information to compare it against, that is better because they know how the system should be operating under a given set of conditions. If you are close to or match those conditions, you have nothing to worry about. A lot of time, the reason you're not dehumidifying properly is due to the airflow side. If you have a low refrigerant charge, that's gonna be pretty obvious. But that aside, if you aren't dehumidifying properly, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, your A coil is oversized for the unit. Very efficient systems, SEER 15, 16 systems, put these humongous A coils in there and they can operate very close to the air temperature going in, which means dehumidification suffers. So if you have a moisture problem, you may have to downsize the A coil a little bit, right? and make sure that you operate that evaporator temperature a few degrees lower. But the only real way to know is dehumidifying properly, you know, other than collecting the condensate and measuring it, and you know, what does that tell you, is to get the air conditions leaving the coil in your supply, doing the calculations, or comparing it against the manufacturer. Now, there is one thing to note. If you have a high latent load, it will result in a somewhat higher evaporator temperature because the evaporator can't drop sensibly in temperature if it needs to dig all this moisture out of the air, which is adding a huge amount of load. So expect a higher coil temperature and a slightly higher air off temperature under high latent loads. And the manufacturer will definitely note that in their information. I hope that helps. Okay. Next question, um, how long should a residential AC system run before shutting off? And again, there is no fixed value. If the system is running 18 or 20 minutes at a time and humidity is okay in the system or the conditions are what they're supposed to be, then it's not an issue. Now, unless it's extreme, if it's cycling every couple of minutes, that's a different. Set the differential on the thermostat right to a value that's recommended okay so if your thermostat differential is too low you're going to short cycle the capacity of the unit also dictates its runtime so if the system is oversized you will cycle much quicker that will definitely impact your humidity reducing the amount of humidity that is removed from the air so i really don't have a fixed value um because again, that part is not my forte to, to know enough that I can give you a value that's gonna cover every application, but the manufacturer should provide that information. I apologize, I don't have more to say on that, but I don't feel that I can just give you a value that's going to apply to everything. Yep, no worries. Okay, well, thank you for everyone who did submit a question. Uh, if we did not get to it, keep an eye out for, um, our Twitter page, Dan Foss Clue US, um, and we will be answering any follow up questions there. So, again, just yes. to say thank you, Jamie, uh, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. Sadly, this is our final webinar in our Perfect Workday series, but we continue, or we encourage you to connect with both Jamie and Dan Foss for further e learning opportunities, as you can see on the screen. Uh, recordings of the four previous webinars with Jamie are up on our YouTube channel. Danfoss Cool US. And uh, as I mentioned at the top, today's webinar will be added there shortly. We enjoyed spending our Wednesday afternoons with all of you over the past few weeks. And um, this certainly won't be the last of us. So we hope to see you again soon. Have a good one and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, guys.